Hello and welcome to a very quick introduction to how to read a urinalysis test strip. First, you're going to ask your patients for a clean catch. That means they're going to urinate into the toilet for a few seconds and then stop. Then they can collect their urine into the device that you have provided them with. This will ensure that any dead skin cells, bacteria, or other things in the urethra will be flushed out first and will not contaminate our reading. Next, you will put on your PPE and then transfer some of the urine to a urinalysis test strip, such as by using a transfer pipette. There are many different brands of urinalysis test strips. In general, you will want to place some urine on all of the squares of the strip and then wait for 30 seconds to 2 minutes. For some brands, different squares will change color at different times. For others, it's more simple. You may want to have a napkin or bench diaper to wick away excess moisture to prevent the color change from one square from leaking and staining the next square. After you have waited for the appropriate time, then compare your urinalysis test strip to the key provided. Different brands of test strips will look for different things. But most should look for specific gravity, which is a measurement of how dense the urine is. Because urine contains water and a bunch of electrolytes and other molecules, it should be denser than deionized water. But if somebody is dehydrated, the specific gravity should go up even further. Next up, all test strips should look for pH. This does not measure acidosis and alkalosis. For that, we need to discuss the pH of the blood in a different chapter. If I were to drink a whole bunch of acidic cranberry juice, however, my blood could temporarily become acidic, if it weren't for the buffers, but eventually my kidneys would remove all of those acids that had just been absorbed from my intestines into the bloodstream and my urine would become more acidic. So the pH of the urine is more a measurement of how the kidneys are regulating the pH of the blood, not what the pH of the blood is. For that, we'll need to do an ABG test in another chapter. All of the other measurements should be looking for things that should not be found in the urine, and thus we'll be looking for a reading of zero or more than zero. You may need to put down specific values, but the most important thing is to determine whether these other things are present in the urine or not. They should not be there. For instance, in this case, we can see that both glucose and ketones are present in the urine. And if you look at my anatomy lab reference, this would tell you that this patient is probably suffering from diabetes. They have both glucose and ketones in the urine, which should not be there. The reason that glucose is there is that blood glucose was high and therefore too much glucose was in the filtrate and exceeded the transport maximum, and therefore it wound up in the urine. However, we could also find glucose in the urine after a night of gorging on Halloween candy, and thus it's nice to also have the backup measurement of ketones, which we would not see the day after Halloween. We would only see in cases of diabetes or starvation. It's important to note that if somebody was starving to death, they would not have glucose in their urine. Their body would have used up all of the glucose in the blood that it had. But this illustrates an important concept. We don't like relying on just one measurement for making a fairly important diagnosis, such as you have diabetes. Therefore, when we're looking at a urinary tract infection, we should not only see leukocytes, but we would also see nitrites. And with kidney damage, we would not only see protein, we would also see red blood cells in the urine. This will bring me up to my last point, that the last square of this particular test strip does double duty. We're looking for hemoglobin, 
and if that hemoglobin is packed up into red blood cells, the last square will appear speckled. Red blood cells only appear in the urine if the filtration membrane has been damaged and the large red blood cells accidentally get filtered into the nephron. On the other hand, if the liver gets damaged, then the liver cannot do its job of recycling red blood cells, and instead of being recycled cleanly, they will just explode out in the bloodstream wherever they happen to be when they reach the end of their lifespan, and this will leave hemoglobin floating around freely, some of which will wind up in the filtrate and not be reabsorbed, and this will create, rather than a speckled appearance on the last strip, a more spread out and uniform green appearance on the last strip. If you're not sure whether it's red blood cells or hemoglobin, take a look for urobilinogens and bilirubins. If it's liver damage, you would expect urobilinogens and bilirubins to also test positive on our urinalysis test strip. And if they're not, well then it could be so many red blood cells that you're not seeing the individual speckles, but you're just getting an entire wash. But that wraps up this very brief description of how to read a urinalysis test strip. More information can be found on my Anatomy and Physiology Lab Reference, which you can download for free at oercommons.org. Thank you for watching.